So um, the focus of our lab uh, at the University of Otago is to study pharmacogenetics, or how we can use genetic information to explain inter-individual variability in drug response, such as to explain why some people have adverse reactions to certain drugs, or why some medications are not working effectively for certain individuals, and that what actually brings us to nanopore sequencing, because one of the genes that we are looking at is a gene called CYP2D6. So uh, why and what is CYP2D6? It's a gene that codes for the enzyme, the liver enzyme CYP2D6, which is responsible for the breakdown and also uh, uh, or activation of about a quarter of all drugs available. So it affects a lot of people. It includes uh, like cancer drugs such as tamoxifen, many of the psychiatric drugs, also the commonly used analgesic codeine. And it's also a very interesting and complicated gene. Despite the small size of the gene, um, it is highly polymorphic, so the FAMFA or the Pharmacogene Variant Consortium database has recorded more than 100 star alleles with more than 200 genetic variants, including SNPs and also indels in this gene. The NOMAD database has recorded more than 1,000 genetic variants in this small gene, including more than 400 missense and more than 30 loss of function variants. So I'm going to use these star allele uh, terms quite a lot throughout the presentation. So it's a uh, standard nomenclature we use in pharmacogenetics to normalize the different haplotype of pharmacogene. So it's marked by the gene name followed by an asterisk here and, uh, and the number. And it's usually, um, each allele usually have several subvariants and each of them are being characterized by uh, one or more than one genetic variants. And each star allele can be linked to certain function or phenotype. Other complexities of the CYP2D6 gene is because it shares more than 90% similarities with the CYP2D7 pseudogene, and the similarities of a span large fragments of the gene. In addition, the gene is also affected by structural variation. So there has been known it can be, the whole gene can be deleted, the gene can be duplicated, or even multiplicated up to 13 copies have been reported. There are also some other complexities related to CYP2D7 including small sequence uh, conversion between the two genes, uh, gene hybrids both way between the genes, and also other complexities that is called tandem rearrangement, where there are several copies of the gene and they are unidentical to each other. All of this make the C2DC genotyping methods a very um, challenging job. Most of Kiro methods um, start with a long PCR to amplify the C2DC gene. Uh, and to avoid mistargeting of the CYP2D7. And then several approaches such as Sanger sequencing or real-time tagment assay can be used um, to genotypes. And most of these only target pre-selected variants just because the high number of the variant in this gene. And it, it is very useful in um, mo uh, most cases, but it can also be problematic in certain situations. So for example, here I show the key variants of STAR2, which is a normal allele of the gene. It's being characterized by these two variants here, one in exon 6 and one in exon 9. However, these two variants of STAR2 are also shared by many other star alleles, including the non-functional one. For example, if you have this intron 1 variant here, it is now STAR11, which is a non-functional allele. Or if you have this exon 1 variant here, it is now STAR12, also a non-functional allele. So in certain situations, targeting the key variants can lead to misgenotyping and then uh, misphenotyping. The short read based NGS methods can, of course, target the whole gene. However, it is actually not the method of choice for CYP2D6 because of the short nature of the technology. There is a misalignment issue with the pseudo gene, as shown by this paper here. Then, whole genome or whole exome sequencing, the CYP2D6 information is not uh, actually very accurate. And most of, uh, last, uh, probably the most um, important thing is because most of these methods lack the confident and straightforward. Uh, variant facing, thus giving the haplotype information. And that brings us to nanopore sequencing. We want to see whether we can sequence this CYP2D6 gene and detect all the variants. Can we determine the haplotypes? And can we, in sample with gene duplication, can we actually determine which allele is actually duplicated? So to do this, we included uh, several reference samples from Korea and 25 clinical samples from our own uh, adverse drug reaction cohort. It's a well-mixed sample. We included 16 different star alleles, including different subvariants of some alleles, and also samples with gene duplication. For reference genotype, to compare to. For coil sample, it's available in the GRM, which is a published data set. And for clinical samples, we did Sanger sequencing. 
So this is an amplification-based method. So first we amplify the whole CYP2D6 region, including upstream and downstream region. Then we use the PCR barcoding kit to barcode the samples to enable multiple samples in one sequencing run. We use the R9.4 flow cell with the uh, version 9 one deligation kit. And for data analysis, because I did it like earlier this year, we used the first GAPI version with flip-flop. Then we use Porchop and Nanofield to demultiplex and filter out the quality and length that we want. Then we use two different mapping and two different variant calling tools. And lastly, we use WhatsApp to face the variance. So this is the result of our first run. We got about 3 million reads. It looks good, but actually not, because only about 4% of them actually have uh, this target more than uh, 6 KB reads. It's not uh, totally unexpected, because during PCR barcoding, we have observed this 1, 2 KB uh, unspecific bands. And in the second round, we apply this enrichment method using um, bits supplemented with PEC and TWIN try to remove all reads less than 3 to 4 KB. And we see here we can uh, we manage to enrich the target reads up to more than 30%. Nevertheless, uh, all samples genotype in these two sequencing rounds give us uh, enough coverage with the lowest coverage about 200x, which is more than enough to genotype. So because we use two different mapping tool and fair and calling tool, the first thing we do is to compare them. So we did it on the uh, seven reference samples. We actually observed that combination of Minimap2 and Nanopolis gave us the less false positive variance, and thus we used them to analyze the entire cohort. So we see here, and also in previous presentation, that the false positive is, is there at this moment. And we apply this uh, strategy here based on the Nanopolis quality scores. It's a strategy being published elsewhere as well. And we see here that the nanopolis quality score uh, ratio to the deep uh, red depth is actually very indicative of the trueness of the variant. As we see here that the false uh, positive always give us very low uh, number. While in clairvoyant, the other variant calling tool that we try is not quite indicative. That's another reason why we use nanopolis. So this false positive variance has been reported before. It consisted of transition variance and also uh, indels in the homopolymer regions has been also explored in the previous presentation. Uh, Nanopore has been always reported to be less reliable in indel variance. However, we saw that in, um, in indels outside of the homopolymer region, which is actually the key variance of some of the common star alleles of CYP2D6, we can actually detect all the fares in all sample bearing them which is very good. So in total, after filtering out the false variant, we got 72 variants. Uh, all, all the genotypes match to reference genotype. And 21 of them, we can assign them to non uh, star alleles up to the subvariant level. This is quite amazing because some samples have quite a lot of variants we, we can face. And each of them can be matched completely to the subvariant level to the single variant that is known. And this is traditionally have to be done using allele-specific PCR, which is quite laborious and time-consuming. And this nanopore method is very straightforward. And we see here the fire and facing using WhatsApp is very clean, and we are very confident. So for the rest, uh, for the remaining 11 samples, we cannot match them either to known uh, subvariant or uh, known allele. We submitted them to FANFA and it's being accepted and be assigned to Norfolk allele or Norfolk subvariants. And some of these Norfolk subvariants are also reported by other groups that later submitted to FAMFA as well, and they are using totally different methods. So it's kind of very good validation of our results. We also find, uh, we also found five Norfolk variants with not yet cattle in FAMFA before. All of them are rare with le a population allele frequency less than 1%. Oh, sorry. So the last thing that we want to do is to detect a duplicated allele. This is uh, so to see whether a sample has a gene duplication. This is done by this duplex PCR here. So in addition to the 6 KB fragment, we target this 3.5 KB fragment, which is specific to the duplicated copy. But the problem is uh, we cannot actually tell which allele is actually duplicated. And in some sample, it's very important. Like for example, here, if we get uh, this sample with this diplotype, star 4 and star 2, Star 4 is a non-functional allele, but star 2 is a normal allele. So we actually want to know whether the star 4 is duplicated or the star uh, 2 is duplicated, because phenotypically it will be different. If the star 4 is duplicated, 
there are two non-functional alleles and one functional allele. And in this case, there are two functional alleles. So the enzyme activity is actually two to one um, uh, in ratio. So to do this with nanopore sequencing, we can easily do first by looking at the uh, superfraction or the allele ratio in the nanopolis physical files. And we see here that the ratio is actually about two to one ratio. So we can determine that this allele here on the top is actually the duplicated one. It's probably more easily done uh, us using the face band file on IGF. This is a typical face band file of a non-duplicated sample, and it is uh, of a duplicated sample. We can see here that uh, this is of a representation of rates of the duplicated allele. Um, so, so far it worked very great for us. However, we still have some limitation that has been discussed before by Timothy as well, that we still have some false negative variants, and those are actually variants that disrupt or create homopolymer regions. So, and the other one is in a variant that is in the non-duplicated allele of the duplicated sample, just because it has lower allele frequency, and it sometimes fall below the threshold of the variant calling tool that we use. So for these uh, examples, we have to actually go back to the band file and check them visually. So in summary, the nanopore sequencing for sip 2 d 6 uh, work very great for us. We can analyze multiple samples simultaneously. We can accurately detect and face the variants. We can determine the haplotypes to the subvariant level, and we can reliably detect the important indels in this gene. Also, we can detect the duplicated allele when it's present. There are some limitations still, including the false positive and false negative, and also because this is an amplification-based method, we still cannot see, for example, the whole gene deletion, because it's basically a non uh, cannot be amplified, and we also have not extended these methods to sample with other uh, complex structural variation. So looking forward, we are uh, look, uh, looking to analyze at more samples. We just received a new cohort of uh, some African samples to analyze, and also we are looking uh, towards to um, amplification-free methods to be able to capture the more uh, other complex uh, structural variant allele. So lastly, I will thank all my supervisors and also the funding, uh, Kandi Center for Pharmacogenomics and the University of Otago Scholarship, and also the, uh, all the patients that um, have volunteered their samples, and also all these people who have made this amazing and simple tools for us, the non-bioinformaticians, to actually carry out the work. Thank you for listening.